So, hi everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host Andrew, and tonight I'm going to ask Father Turbo and Cyprian of a band that you like, or maybe like one of your favorite bands or artists. What is a weak album they have put out? Like, what is an album that you like in an otherwise pretty awesome discography? Oh, uh. You know, The Red Shoes by Kate Bush. I don't know why you listen to that one. Yeah, it's like, interestingly enough, it's the one where she got all these like, collaborators in there. like, mm-hmm. And it's just, that's weird. I mean, it, it's got some okay stuff in there, but it's not, it's definitely not my favorite. It's definitely mm-hmm. like, yeah, I don't, I don't listen to that album. So. Hmm. Hmm. Cyprian, what about you? No, honestly, I can't. Honestly, I, that's a that's a, such an interesting question. I feel like it's almost one that I, I that I that I would have had to actually like think about. But I so rarely talk to people about like, yeah, all good except for this one album. No, I don't have one. What's yours? Maybe I'll think. Maybe I'll think of one. Maybe yeah, I'll, I'll vamp one. for a minute. Um, I'm a big old Beastie Boys fan. And mm-hmm. followed by probably arguably their best and most challenge or their best and most like um, genre pushing and creative album, which is Hello Nasty. They released uh, to the five boroughs afterwards, which taken on its own is probably not such a bad album, but the production's different uh, from what I understand. They weren't in control of it. So it sounds a lot more polished and it normally mm-hmm. does. And it's a straight hip hop album and uh, it's angrier. They're very angry about the stuff that was going on after 9-11. Hello Nasty was like right mm. before 9-11. And then we got involved in the Iraq war, George Bush, mm. oil, blah, blah, blah. And they started to get really political. And like, that's not really what I listened to them for. It's not a bad album. And even like they had two more after that, one all music, like one all um, just a... Uh, no, uh, no lyrics. There was just them jamming, like just all music, whatever. And then uh, one after that, which is their last one, and uh, Hot Sauce Committee Part Two, which is their very last one, is a very good album. And it's a lot more chill, kind of back to them having fun and making jokes and stuff like that. But to the Five Burrows is like is definitely their weakest album, and it's like one I never really think to listen to, and it's not one I would ever really play around my kids. Like, cause there's a lot of angry swearing, a lot of like, this isn't fun swearing. This is like, this dude is pissed kind of swearing, which is like not fun. So, and it's when MCA's voice started to go really, really bad. You can hear his voice straining really, really hard. So I think they would agree with me too. I think in their, uh, their autobiography, they say that is our worst album. So, Hmm. yeah. Yeah. I don't have one. But it, but I'm sure I'll think of one and I'll put it in the the comments on the video on YouTube so everybody can see. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um. And then, Father, did you like Woven Hand's new album? Uh nah. I mean, actually, I sh- man, I should have picked Woven Hand. No, no, I didn't. Um, I didn't. In fact, you know he he's had these moments where it's like kind of like a dip, but uh, the one before this last one, these, his last two albums have been just consistently like, like in the dirt for me. So um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really care for it. And it's just kind of like, I don't think, I don't know if he's going to pull up out of this one. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So. He's kind of older, isn't he? Yeah. 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 So, and there's other things there too. I don't, I don't want to speculate on air about it, but you know, I wonder about his, I wonder about what he's dabbling into these days, you know? Well, there's something to be said and this doesn't have to be a whole thing, but there is something to be said about when people um, like, like I just said with the BC boys, when they go into something with an agenda when they're mm-hmm. going in there being like, this is this is something we want to do to put this particular message out there. And like some of those cues that come up when you're being creative mm-hmm. kind of get forced to the side. Like they ignore some of those little voices that might be saying, hey, this is not such a good idea. Cause you've already like 
you've already determined what this is going to look yeah, like. Yeah, you've already committed. You're, yeah. You're, and that commitment, which keeps you from being kind of like in synergy, right? It, it keeps you from being in synergy and like the controlling other thing. That's why it's so it was so easy for Pete Townsend to go off the rails and so hard for like, let's say like a Keith Richards or something, because, you know, Pete Townsend's like, I'm the maestro, I'm the maestro. And I, I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I'm the one making all this stuff happen. And people who are like that, it's very easy for them, I think, to kind of like paint themselves in a corner, go off the rails, do all that, because they see themselves as the kind of source and arbiter of everything cre- happen, happening creatively. Whereas other people tend to like, well, here's the muse. I'm listening yeah, to the, the muse. Inspiration, not, yeah, 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 yeah. Inspiration, yeah. you know? So yeah. I, I think that's like really important to listen to because when you have an agenda, the, the, the broader context takes a back seat. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's interesting enough because I would just say, this is just whatever, but getting back to so people can timestamp it now. This is when we start talking about real stuff, I guess. But like, this is when it, it's very much the same thing with prayer. Mm. Like the person, like you can feel it in a parish. Like you go to a parish, and it's like, okay, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And you can, you can feel when someone's got an agenda. You can feel when it's like, okay, mm. you know, uh, there's multiple agendas that you can you can have right sure. um versus where someone's just like there's an audience of one and we are just trying to actually worship god there's you can f- you can feel that synergy there in the prayer because even if it isn't executed you know technically well you can there's there is that spirit that's there that you know it's 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 love and it's relationship and it's synergy. It's all those wonderful mm-hmm. things that happen, you know, creative. It, it is, even though, hear me when I say this, not innovative, it's creative because they're not the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas when someone has an agenda, they're like, oh, we're like edgelord orthodoxy. We want to like push this edge, whatever it is politically, you know what I mean? Or we're, you know, kind of LARPing. We want to show everyone that we, you know, are going to get as close as we can to, you know, 17th century Muscovite, whatever rubrics. It's mm-hmm. like, ah, like that's good. But in a parish, whatever, like you can, you can kind of feel it sometimes sure. because the, the agenda is to do this other thing versus meeting God in the temple. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking to meet God in the temple, if you're looking to meet God in prayer, that creative reality is expressed and experienced. But when you have an agenda, it can really kind of squelch some of that. And it just becomes so rigid and so kind of like thin and, and not thin in the good way, like the Irish way. That's, that's the good way. But then in the sense of like, it doesn't have the, um, the substance to it that leads someone into, you know, prayer that is at least opening the potential for, entering into the eternal and the transcendent, you know, so no. it, it applies across the board. I think mm-hmm. I, there wasn't, and I'm sorry, father, it wasn't the, I don't know what it's called, but the big dome uh, behind the altar or in the altar, but behind the altar itself, wasn't that icon back there at our parish originally going to be something different. And then you like at the, like kind of, as you started to oh, get the down, apps. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And the apps I had, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. I was going to do um, the uh, Ascension. And so I had already drawn it out there, if you remember. I had already drawn it out there, whatever. And then it was, you I mean, to it just muse. hit me like a diamond right between the eyes, you know, as uh, <laughs> as uh, what's McCall would say. And it was it was really clear what I had to do. But the question is, would I do it? And I think this is where mm. it gets hard for people because mm. I just had that happen again on the other, on the um, South wall here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a couple people have been moved around and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And someone can say, well, that's just your lack of planning. And sure it is. I'm, I'm, I'm everyone knows I'm a terrible, I'm not organized. I'm a terrible planner. I'm a terrible priest, but I'm willing to make a U-turn. And I'm willing to say, nope, I think I don't got this right. I think that I had my idea of what I want, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
and I'm I'm open to because here's here's the thing, and this is this is again getting into um, what we would maintain is is like the key difference between us in a lot of ways is that we still believe that Christ is the head of the church, and so if if Christ wants to say something, then he can make it apparent, and we'll be willing to listen. You know, it's it's getting into the spirit. Not necessarily the kind of like, uh, if this is going to make sense, the um, kind of like theoretical practicalities. I know those two words are kind of contradictive, but the what I mean is the theoretical theoretical practicalities of like, well, in theory, the way that papism runs is like this and this and this and this, right? But we see the spirit of it, you know, kind of squelching what we would say is this submission to the Holy Spirit and Christ. In, in leading the church, right? And so, although I'm taking this and kind of applying it maybe in a unhealthy, unsober way to my own personal experience, but I would just say this is part of how I have, you know, tried to submit myself to the life of the church and being open to really, um, you know, not hold on to things and, and just really be willing to say I, I could be wrong. And I want to be corrected, you know, and having the proper um, aspects to to hold me accountable. You know what I mean? So um, got to be willing to make a U-turn. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's like and I think that actually could be a good transition into the question I had, which had come up in adult education and I was busy doing something else. So I was not able to hear the answer. And this is something I really care about. Because we had talked before, the per- the person's question was, you were talking about the conscience and how basically the conscience can be, um, like you can be following your conscience, but your conscience has been like warped and distorted in a way that like what you're feeling is like you're following your conscience, your conscience isn't even maybe necessarily on fire, but you're still kind of like incorrect about stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, um, so this person asked, well, if our conscience is warped and distorted, what do we go off of? I mean, because like if I'm still following the conscience, if I'm still like trying to follow this gentle voice inside me or like not trying to get that feeling that comes when your conscience is pricked, but I'm still doing things incorrectly. Like, for example, I used to get a conscience prick when I would not... um Oh, like, okay, so if I were like, we're doing the kiss of peace, I wouldn't cross myself before bowing to another person. Well, it turns out that that's not the correct thing to do, etiquette wise. You're not really supposed to do that. So, but I get a conscience prick from it. Okay, so then what am I supposed to do? You know, or like little things about like how I feel like I should do this. Well, technically, that's not really correct, you know, like etiquette wise. So I, I kind of wanted to at least touch on that because listening to the, like your conscience and kind of trying to be able to take a U-turn and take correction. So anyway. Yeah. I think there's a couple of things to that. Uh, the first one is number one, sometimes what we perceive to be our conscience is not always necessarily like our conscience, but even if it is for the sake of just kind of keeping it simple, um, kind of getting back to this U-turn and being able to be willing to say, okay, you know, I, I could have this wrong. So in other words, you have to, you have to first realize that that presupposition that just because it comes from within you, that it's true is, is false. Mm. And that's really important because that's what a lot of people are running off of. That's, that's in one, one very tangible way where new age spirituality has kind of like, infused itself with everybody, including some Orthodox folk, um, quote unquote, because here's the thing. And bring me back, right? Because we're about to go on a rabbit trail. But like, you know, there's people who are, I mean, they're in the church, but they're not Orthodox. And it happens all the time. Um, And it's okay, you know, because as long as number one, they acknowledge that like they're in that process and they're willing to submit to the life of the church and to the tradition of the church, to the authority of the church to be formed, no problem. The problem is a lot of people just they say no, I already know, no, 
like I can, I know truth. I can tell truth when I can see it. It's like, uh, you know, I don't know. Can you? Probably not, you know, probably not. Um, and so that being said, that first presupposition is super important because unless you're willing to say, I could have this wrong, then there's really kind of like no hope. Um, so moving past that, that's where tradition is super important because, you know, tradition is the experience of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. And it's one of those things where we can have a cold conversation about capital T, lowercase t, tradition, which is fine. But to answer your question succinctly, which I usually don't do, I would say that the tradition of the church is arranged in such a way that a person, if they follow the follow the kind of the tradition of the church and where the church finds her moorings, they'll they'll be able to develop their conscience in a way that, that is not only efficacious but safe. Because the church leads you and instructs you to submit your conscience, your inner, you know, your your perceived awareness, your perceived understandings to her tradition. So I think this, and I may I may even practice this and do this. But then if the church says otherwise, I have to say, like, okay, like, I'm willing to say that I got it wrong, right? And we can, there's a million and one different ways we can, like, tackle this. Because it gets into all these tough issues in regards of, like, you know, smoking cigarettes, you know, tattoos, uh, you know, fasting practices like there's all this like kind of spectrum which are very and, and here's the thing some people are going to disagree with me but they are very much so pastoral issues right because anybody who's actually helped someone come to christ come to a place of repentance and then begin to love christ and love the church knows that you can't just slap a cannon on somebody. It just, it mm. doesn't work. Mm. If you, it like anyone who has any real experience knows that it just doesn't work that way. The cannons and things like that and, and introducing the someone to the tradition is absolutely necessary. Don't get me wrong. They're necessary, but it's like anything else. Um, you do not chastise a six, a, a six year old child the way that you would, you know, a three year old child. You just don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you just don't. Um, and what's the, you know, what's the common denominator? I mean, you know, the love, that's the common denominator is love for the child, right? And I think that's the thing is, so when you understand that the church loves you, God loves you and has these parameters set out because of love for you, then it's a lot easier to say, okay, well, let me, let me submit myself. And then in that process, let me check. Okay, like I have this experience. I have this feeling or this thought. Okay, what does the church say? Okay. Uh, well, it looks like I'm not lining up. You know, I'm going to humbly, prayerfully submit. Talk to my godfather. Talk to my godmother. Talk to my priest. You know what I mean? Pray. And then just give it some time and just follow what I'm being told, right? And then eventually you come around to this understanding to some degree or something changes. But if you have faith and you approach God in such a way that you want to please God and you want to be saved, those things will get worked out. Even if it means that there's a measure of economia that needs to be given to you, it's not that you prescribe it to yourself. You don't cut yourself the slack. You say, you, you say, okay, Lord, whatever you got. And then you allow the Lord through the parameters of the church, your godfather, your godmother, the priest, to to say, okay, hey, this is what we're going to do to get you where you need to be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it just it's the same it thing does. across the board, you know. Father, like, yeah, father, could you could you just dig a little further into the concept of economy, please? Because I feel like it's coming up more and more, and I feel like I'm I'm hearing people uh, talk about it in the context of like as you were kind of alluding to, like individuals giving themselves a pass 
and being like, oh, this is economia, like deciding it for themselves in a way. Like how does, so how does, can you just get into yeah. like, how does the structure, because it's, I think it's an important co concept. Yeah, so in order to talk about economia, we have to talk about uh, acrivia, which is like, there's the exception and there's the standard, right? The, the, the rule, the way that something is expected to be, to be, you know, done. And so economia is there and it's given in the light of what's been established in regards of, let's say, a canon, right? A praxis, right? Something that has been established uh, in the life of the church through, you know, ecumenical councils, sometimes local councils, you know, um, through hierarchical decisions, pastoral decisions in concert with the tradition of the church, the canons and, right, apostolic canons, all that stuff. And so... Economia is the um, the pausing or the the lifting of that rigor or that rule for the sake of one's weakness and salvation. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that it, it's not so, you don't give yourself economia has to be given to you mm -hmm. because the person who's like, oh, I'm just blah, blah, blah myself. You keep practicing that. Next thing you know, it's like you've basically um it, it's like the person prescribing themselves medicine right um and you know we were talking about this before it's like instead of um you know a milligram instead of a microgram you're doing a milligram and it's a big difference right sure. and next thing you know it's like why am i like so sick meaning you know I don't even really believe in all this. Well, how did I get from, I was on fire and I love the church. And I was like, I want to chain myself to the church. And I was begging God to, to help me and, and cure me of my passions. And I, I wanted to be saved. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't know if I really believe this. And I don't really know if, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's from you basically diagnosing yourself, taking your own medicine, not, not listening to the doctor. Right, but your spiritual father, your confessor, the teachings of the church, and you thinking like, I know better. I don't need a microgram of this. I I need a I need a milligram, you know. And that taking out the analogy, it's like, you know, the small ways we compromise fasting, right? And the small ways we compromise all these other things, you know, like ah, you know, I'm gonna give myself a prayer rule. Like those things like that, that's how someone ends up, you know, a year in, two years in, three years in, 12 years in, they barely believe and they only go to church because of their kids. You know what I mean? Because they they were basically prescribing themselves the medicine that they thought was best and it's it's it slowly killed them, you know? So is so, there like, oh, sorry, no, Father, please, please. I was just going to say, so the thing is, is like, there's these standards, right? There's expectations and there's ways of doing things. Right, which are, you know, there's just accepted ways that have been given to us by the apostles, ratified through the canons and the communal councils, and we hold to those things. We hold to these traditions that have been passed down to us. Um, and what we recognize, and the church recognizes, that like life happens, right? And so um, there's times when um, economia, meaning exceptions, have been given for the sake of salvation, for the sake of the life of the person. But again, the exception kind of proves the rule, right? It's like, you know, the, I mean, it's the hot button issue right now and people lose their mind every time it's talked about, but, you know, baptism is a great example. Like baptism is the best example right now because it is it is the problem, mm -hmm. right? It is the problem. So, you know, what has happened is something that is given as economia has become now the standard. Right. And so the way many people are received in the church, that's just it's just fact. Like, yeah, it's not even doesn't, there's no debate about it in that sense. Like whether someone wants to, you know, accept it or not. OK, fine, whatever. You know, who am I? But I'm just saying it's just a fact that baptism by three immersions is the standard and always has been the standard. And. It and that changed. there's only one baptism. Forgive me, Father. And that there's only one baptism because there's only one church. There's only one baptism. There's only one church. So, okay, you know, it's like these these standards changed, and they changed to kind of like 
the church allows certain things to just address certain unfortunate, messy realities. Because as the thing is, as opposed to some other confessions, quote unquote, the Orthodox Church is the church of the living God that deals with living human beings, which means that sometimes things were not rigid. And, and that's one of the problems is that for a lot of people, this is why this is this is kind of like a royal path moment. I had one of these in a while. Like, that's why people who like, OK, I'm squarely in the traditionalist camp. Right. But like. You have to be careful because tradition for the sake of tradition outside of Christ can't happen. And if you if you become too rigid on something, then it's like you begin to start telling Christ what needs to happen, right? And that's why we do have people, um, not just with like obviously St. Dismas, you know, the good thief, but like, you know, I think it's Porfirios. I think that was named the jester. Like we have these accounts, you know, um, who was the saint we were just talking about? Procopius, you know? You have these saints where it's like, whoa, like obviously they're breaking the standard, right? And I hate that it's just baptism because, again, it's like the, like the hot topic issue right now, hot button issue. Sorry, hot topic is the store. Hot button issue. But like it's just it's a, it's a real easy example to kind of put this across in regards of like, you know, economia, quote unquote, and like the problem with people with it becoming a standard versus like it's, it's no longer economia, right? It's, it's now an error, right? It's become, it's become an error, right? And that error has, has um, results. It's like, um, you know, people don't realize that, you know, if you, um, if you take a snapshot of a moment in time, let's just take a snapshot of any of us at a moment in time, even your best day, Right. If you really are have your wherewithal, you would not want to be judged by based on that snapshot. Even on your best day, you see what I'm saying? Because why? Because the totality of your life is so much more broader than that, right? So when someone wants to take a snapshot and say, okay, this is the thing, it's like, that's problematic because the, the breadth of what God has for people in regards of, you know, God wants all to be saved, you know, and we have to be very careful to not make that snapshot, you know, a death sentence. And I think that's what happens sometimes in the, in the one end with conservative, the conservative approach, which I'm definitely in that camp. Right. But on the other end of it, obviously, where people um, have no regard for standards, which is really the bigger problem. Right. It's, it's the bigger problem. That's where you get people who kind of getting back to the original we were talking about in regards of um, agendas right because again it's it isn't just baptism but here we are right but you can't really argue the fact that the reason why people promote again whatever but the reason why people promote you know the current practice in which they in the way that they do in regards of just chrismation is because they have an ecumenical an ecumenist perspective Right. They believe that they believe in the branch theory and they believe in all these things. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's just that it's an ecclesi- it's an issue of ecclesiology. They don't understand what the church's ecclesiology is. Right. Or they do. And, and, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. They do understand it, but they reject it and they want to change it. And those people That's, exist because I, yeah. I know people like that. Yeah. I know yeah. people like that. I know clergy like that. Who That's what they think. You know what I mean, I mean, but from from where do they get the from where does the authority come to change holy tradition? Feelings. Yeah, I don't want to offend someone. Um, feelings. I don't want to make a U turn. You know, like everybody remember this isn't scripted, right? So I'm not trying to be that guy, but I think one of the biggest things, and, and you know, whatever. Everyone knows I'm a jerk. Everyone knows I'm arrogant. Everyone knows I'm ignorant. Everyone knows I'm slot. Like all this stuff. Okay, that's totally fine. But the one thing I'll tell you, I'm I'm willing to make a U-turn. If I see that I'm wrong on something, I'm willing to make a U-turn, right? So if nothing else, I put that forward to anybody. It's like I fail on every aspect of quote unquote being a priest, but as a man before God, I can say I'm willing to make a U-turn. That's the thing is a lot, a lot of people, 
they're not willing to make U-turns. They're not willing to acknowledge that like I was wrong about something or or whatever. You know what I mean? I got no problem saying like I was wrong. Yep. <laughs> you know? Did you guys ever see Prometheus, the movie? The aliens? Yeah. The aliens one? Yeah. 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 You know how Charlie's Theron? Do you guys remember how Charlie's Theron's character died? She was running. I don't even remember her being in that. It's a forget completely forgettable movie. She outside? She dies outside. She dies outside. How does, because when, how does she die? The ship is rolling and she's running along right in the ship's path. And she's running with like someone else and they dive out of the way. But yeah. she won't dive. She won't deviate from her course because mm. she's got it in her brain. If I just keep running, I'll be all right. But she's crushed. Even though if she had just jumped like two or three feet to the left or to the right, she would have been mm. fine. And take it for what it is. I mean, even a broken clock, whatever. Ridley Scott's like, oh, because she was so stuck in her ways. She couldn't possibly think that there might be any other way for her to go mm. except for straight. And, like, to the point that I'm trying to make is, like, the ability to, like, jump to the left instead of, like, keep running straight. Because God is an excellent storyteller, and he doesn't ever really refer on the deus ex machina, like, story device. So he's not, uh, like, he can't, like, really, I mean, he can, but also, like, it still fits within the rules. Just come along and change the rules by like divine providence or whatever to make the story end. Like he doesn't do that. Like it's not been my experience that like, even when that woman who had had the abortion went to heaven, he still needed to abide by a rule. Mm -hmm. And so he sent her back so mm -hmm. she could do a confession and officially get it off, like clean and absolved. Like he's not gonna be like, well, you know what? It's fine. I make a new rule. If this, if you're repentant after death, blah, 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 then it'll be okay. You know what? I make a new rule. Like we'll, we'll just one little sprinkle of water is good enough. Yeah. Because when he makes a rule the first time, it's perfect. <laughs> you know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. And, so and that's what makes it good storyteller. He, he needs to. And that's the thing about economia. Economia isn't about destroying what's established with the tradition. It's about meeting the weakness of the person and getting them. However, that could be to the Holy spirit to to be in line with the life of the church you know what i mean so i think this is i think this is a thing because for a lot of people you know and i get it i get it you know i have had those moments and may god forgive me and help me when i've been in arrogance critical of of i didn't see it this way but i realized like critical of like quote unquote the church you know and, you know, God corrected me, thanks be to God, and, I, you know, I repent of it. And, you know, I mean, honestly, it's one of the reasons why I'm so hard in the paint about tradition is because I've suffered from the errors of, you know, taking in the, the delusion of, you know, knowing better. Oh, well, that was kind of then, this is now, you know, and, and having a much more... Um, kind of, you know, a, a very much more liberal, modernistic, academic, very much looking to be academic intentionally, like perspective on things. And it's wrong. It's wrong. And I say it's wrong, not just out of an abstract. I've seen I've, it's wrong because it's not life giving. It's it's wrong because I'm repenting of it. It's wrong because it doesn't bring you closer to Christ. You know what I mean? And then when when Christ shows you that. You know, thanks be to God for whatever reason, you know, and again, I can't take credit. I'll just say let's, you know, God's mercy, obviously. Um, but when you see that you're wrong, make the U-turn and, and follow Christ. I mean, that's that's what it really boils down to is just it's it's follow Christ. And and I think I think this is the thing, you know, Romans 8, 28, all things work for good for those who love God and call to their purposes, you know, Um I think there's something to be said for the strength of, of Peter, Christ always knowing that his denials and his repentance particularly were going to be the, um, the rod of correction, which also became the support beam in his temple. Mm -hmm. If that makes, if that analogy makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so the one who's able to be corrected by the rod is able to then, you know, not only, you know, 
maintain life in the house, but guard the house and, and guide others into the house because they know they know the shepherd, they know the rod of correction, and they they know you know the kind of play on words in English, which isn't as good and beautiful as if it was Greek, but you know the rod of correction, but also the support rod and how that works mm -hmm. in the life of someone who has repented, who has seen their error. Um, and I, and I, it's another reason why we got to be real careful about things like heretic and stuff like that, because a heretic is someone who has rejected that um, mercy and the patience of the church. Sure, Even yeah. at times of Konomiya, you know, they've rejected it. And then that's what makes them opinionated, where they where they put their opinion over the life of, of the church, you know, the, over the life of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, and I know that also the the allowing of the fall, it like puts a particular stench on that fall and you can kind of smell it from like a mile away. Like when a person is in a certain state of mind, you're like, I remember, as long as you're not projecting too much, you know, as long as you're not like filling in gaps, but you're kind of hearing a person talk and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, I can kind of get a sense of where your head's at. And I remember what that was like and it's not a great place to be, mm -hmm. you know, and like uh, my wife and I were at the grocery store and we saw a couple get into a car and he had like an empty energy drink can on the floor and he was getting in and the car was kind of busted and she was driving, even though they're both kind of older and stuff like that. And he had like a half split cigarette and like, you know, started to smoke it. I'm not painting a very good picture, but what I got was I could remember exactly where I was at when I was doing stuff exactly like that. And I just remember just being like, I filled in a bunch of gaps. I would never hold to any of them, but I was like, I, I, you know, I bet probably plays a lot of video games. It's probably odd. There's a cigarette and then there's probably a vape too. in there somewhere like dudes vaping, probably a couple of monster energy drink bottles, whatever. And I was remembering how painful living life like that really was like, especially before the church. Like, it's just like, there's so much like, um, dullness. Anyway, the point is, is that like, you can kind of get an idea where, where someone's head is at. And it's kind of like, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's a, yeah, it's just, it's one of the values of being able to fall into a place of just being like, okay, well, I can kind of see, you know, Peter, how, how much, how much easier was it for Peter later on when people like, I will never do this. And you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. We'll see. Guess what I said I would never do. Mm -hmm. And I did. I did. And guess what? It's written in the Bible in four different gospels. Exactly what I did. And like, no one's ever going to forget that. And I love St. Peter. I love St. Peter. I've gotten actually like pretty close to St. Peter recently. And like, it's like one of those things of being like, man, how much of an example is that? Like, that's the guy, like, that's the guy that God chose as like the primary, like the, the head apostle. It's just like this dude right here who like my first priest, the baptizing priest that baptized me, he said he was kind of an ass. Like at times, like he was kind of like, uh, you know, he went to wash his feet and he's like, God, don't do this. You know, Christ, Christ was like, let me do this. Like, I know what I'm doing. He's like, then wash my whole body. And Christ is like, okay, can I just wash your feet, please? I'm just trying to wash your feet. And it's like, again, like this hard headed man being able to become like the rock, you know, on which like, so anyway, it's, but the, it's the correct, the correction has to it has to come from Christ. Cause like, I'm thinking when, when you brought up the example of this guy you see in the parking lot and I'm like, there's an important thing to not say, not just that's bad because the world is ready to correct on that too. But then you get Andrew Tate, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Cause Andrew Tate is just, j is ready to tell you that that's bad also. And then here's what you should be doing. Ugh. Right. But that's yeah. even in some ways, that's even it's even worse what he's wanting to lead you to. Clearly. I mean, it's like very antichrist. It's very like it's Indeed. like the answer is not Christ. It's this other thing. Yes. Like, yeah. Yes. Where I would say, you want to check out church? Like if dude came to me and said, what do I do? Like, do you want to check out church? Like Christ is the only Andrew Tate would be like, no, here's how you get a Bugatti. I mean, this is what Andrew Tate would have said. Andrew Tate would have Bugatti. Been like, Bugatti. 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 Like, I don't know what it is. And I know I said it in the group chat, but I just got this. Every time I watch a video by that dude, it seems like he just did a line of an illegal narcotic that goes up the nose, right? And then, like, does it. And he's like, record, like, right away. Well, he, he, swears, he, he swears that he's a caffeine addict. 
So this is one thing that he's admitted to that he says he's just constantly drinking coffee because he likes to be like jittery, up amped and, up on up caffeine. And Adam. Yeah, sounds so. awful. It sounds awful. Well, like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, that was my. Well, it, question. It's the it's the um, the question of what is your desire? Is your desire to be right or to do the right thing? Mm-hmm. Because in order to, if your desire is to do the right thing, you're gonna be, you're gonna be wrong a lot. Yeah, you're gonna be wrong a lot. And that that was something I was talking about with a dude uh, from our church who is in charge of the um, of our community garden. He talked about like people don't need YouTube to do this. People have been doing this for generations. And I kind of, that led the conversation into people don't want to learn and be wrong. Like they don't want, maybe I've talked about this on this podcast before. They want a guaranteed like hijack into the back of the head matrix. Now I know Kung Fu. Like, mm-hmm. like they don't want the the hours spent getting corrected. Be like, what do you mean? You're not, I'm not using this muscle. I'm using this muscle. And they're like, you're not using the muscle correctly. Like hours and hours of that, the, for archery, for me, the missing the shot, spending hundreds of dollars on broken arrows that I'm never going to see again because they flew way out. Like they want like to download the knowledge into their brain without the actual like. But I mean, process. that gets us back to the original sin. You know, I mean, that's ultimately what happened. The self deification that Satan offered and, you know, Eve gladly took a, took part of, you know what I mean? Because. You know, when 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 we read about Adam and Eve being perfect, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't have <clears throat> like it. It's not that they didn't have room to grow. They would still grow and learn. Right. They were still to grow and to learn. They they were perfect in the sense that they were a whole and, and you know, lacked. They lacked nothing in, in, in how God created them, but they were still to develop and eventually to eat the fruit of the quote unquote tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, but you know, that, that development, I don't think it's, um, contrary to patristic, you know, the kind of patristic spirit to say like, yeah, I mean, there would be what we might call mistakes, but it wouldn't be the mistake as we kind of understand it as like a necessity of the fall, but like a necessity of like development in which someone learns through the process of experience. Right. Um, cause you can make a mistake and not, you know, sin, but then someone's like, well, sin is missing the mark, but like, okay, this reality of developing and, and growing is, is one thing. And, you know, the kind of intentional, um, the intentional, you know, um, diverging from God's will, as well as, you know, the kind of dealing with the results of an intent of unintentional diversion of God's will. So in other words, you committing a sin in the sense of intentionally and you also suffering the consequences of your grandfather, great grandfather's intentional sin. Those are different things versus like you learning, a mis- you learning from experience. You know what I'm saying? So if you kind of pull back and you look at Evan Eve and like their process of growing. I think I think that's a very different thing, and it's I think it's an important distinction because, you know, again, this it, it speaks more to how do we really understand God's desire for us and and our salvation, right? Are we are we expect God is not expecting us like that's why it's it's another problem with the kind of Western perspective and that's why i say western because it isn't just like roman catholic right protestants have this view too of like evangelicals have this view of just the moral infraction you know what i mean and it's like that's it's not really yes that's a problem but it's not the thing right it's not the thing because you know um i think it's saint mark the ascetic you know he talks about how the demons are the ones who taught him how to pray right the demons are the ones who taught him how to pray so I get that. I get, you know what I'm I get saying? That. I do. So, get that, so if yeah. you ha- if you understand that and you see that mm-hmm. perspective, then it's like, okay, you know, I mean, forgive me, but it, it's one of the things I'm always looking for in, in a spiritual child. I'm like, you know, of course, everything's in God's hands, but 
when I see a spiritual child who's able to just like, I don't, I don't need to coax them into getting up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where they, where they realize that they're mis- they're not such an egoist anymore that mm-hmm. they can't believe that they made a mistake. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That, that's a huge thing. It's like, don't be such an egoist. Don't be so ridiculous to think that like you shouldn't make a mistake or that you should be whatever. Cause the, because the person who can get past that, now you're cooking with gas. And that's actually the step of actually being in the life of Christ and, and really having this wonderful life in which even the attacks of the demons are room for praise. That, that's how mm-hmm. you get there because you're like, man, Romans 8, 28, all things work for good. God's given me this whole garden for me to grow and to be developed. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. So like um, moral infractions are probably just more just like symptoms of the much larger problem. Correct. Right. Like, correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. They have to be dealt with. I'm, you know, don't, I'm not saying they're not, but it's just, it, they're not the, the core thing. Cause it's very easy to deal with the moral infraction. You know, it's very easy to deal with. Yes. I broke the law. Okay. We'll, we'll deal with you breaking the law. But what are we going to do about, like, why are you breaking the law? Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Wouldn't, you rather, wouldn't you rather deal with, like, why you're breaking the law? Right? Yeah. Um, we had uh, another question that you guys, we had talked about, um, but you guys have found from the comments, I, I think, right? From the, from the comments. Mm-hmm. That I think since we we spent about an hour on that, which is good, like, and question fully answered, I believe. And like, um, looking back, like a lot of what I thought was sin was like, you know, smoke, uh, whatever, whatever. It, it would be like, um, no, this is just frowned upon in Western society. Like this, this, there might even be sin in here, but I'm not even perceiving this as something that might be displeasing to God. Mm -hmm. I'm perceiving this as kind of like a moral infraction, quote unquote, according to like Western society, I guess. Which, which changes, right? Which, that, which, what those things are change. Yeah, it does. I mean, 60 years ago, it would be impossible for my priest to be married to his wife. Because I mean, like that's that's the morality of like America, right. you know. It, it would have been like okay, you know, that comes and goes all the time. Well, that's smoking funny. smoking weed, <laughs> right? Smoking weed, yeah. Like prime exa- prime example. It's so normalized now. It's so normalized, and I was I, I mean, I, there there are many occasions when. I hear people having a conversation and I'll, and I'll just stop like having a conversation about cannabis and I'll just stop and be like, if I was a kid and there were people having this conversation in public, pretty much everybody around them would be looking at them crazy. Like, look at the, like, look at these, oh, what are these people potheads? Like, I can't believe that you're having, and this is, and they'll just, it's just out in the open. So you know that it's that, that sort of, that impermanence of the morality if you're gonna, if you're just gonna go off, what does society accept yep. in general? Yeah, because it's gonna change. Yeah, I mean, drag queen story hour for crying out loud. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean they're they're de- yeah. they're degeneracy. I mean, I mean, God help still. us, God help us. But let's just all be really clear. Maps, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maps oh, are yeah. Maps that's are probably coming. the most that's, intense one. You know what I'm coming. saying? Maps are coming. So it, it's like, um. The, that's reality and and i think this is the thing too about getting back to like because i'm really if i was a better person if i was a more disciplined priest i would i would write something about this but it's this whole thing about because it's it's kind of like core obviously to my life being in in a city in the urban core quote unquote but this idea of like what is it like to be you know what the spirituality of lot living in the middle of Sodom, the spirituality, because, you know, the scriptures, Lot is a righteous man, you know what I mean? Um, And dealing with not looking to the culture around you as the standard, but to what the Almighty has established, that spirituality, 
right? Spirituality versus psychology. You know what I mean? Spirituality versus moralism, right? Um, the the law of God versus the law of man. Like like understanding and discerning these things. Um, this is this is really interesting to me because. Um, on the one hand, obviously, because I'm in a city, you're in a city. But on the other hand, I was speaking with someone about this this last week, too, which is like, you know, I'm willing to go to bat with this. I think some, you know, this, I was speaking with a spiritual daughter who lives in the country. And her family, who I love dearly, they live in the country. And it's just like, we were talking about this this week, and it's like, People get it twisted when they think like, oh, you know, let's just escape and go to the let's go to the country. It's like you're fooling yourself at this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, sure, there are some initial trade offs. It's more it's more quiet and less noise pollution, like all that's there. I'm not taking that away. But at the end of the day, it's like you got tweakers, you got a lot of the same, but a different set of problems and. You know, we've talked about this before. What's come upon the earth now? It's come upon the earth. It isn't just, you know, like in the city. It's like anyone who's got internet, which is everybody, you're you're infected. It's so, the virus that spreads on the winds of the internet. You know, and so the thing is, is like, how do you how do you discern? How do you discern what is what is true? How do you discern? And I think this is getting back to. You know, like the person, this is again, getting back to some of that U-turn, the person who's like, I made these choices, boom, boom, boom. And therefore I've made these choices. I'm going to stick to these choices and these choices, whether I chose to live a certain lifestyle, live a certain way, these choices in themselves are what's going to save me and protect me and my family. It may not be. No. Uh, it, it could be. Your choices could be the thing that actually, you know, paint you in a corner. And, and I think this is the thing where people want to live in such a way that they don't need God. Right? They, they want to live in such a way that they don't need God. I have my moral structure. Even, look, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I have my moral structure, this and that. And the thing is, is that's all good. And there's grace in it. There's energy in it. I mean, I was saying this the other day. It's like one of the things that we have to, man, I would love to be able to have a conversation with people about this because there's just, there's so many things that we have to really, I'm all about having a real honest conversation about things, right? What are you talking about, Father? This is what I'm talking about. Like, I want to talk about people who are not orthodox, but are seeking Christ because they exist, obviously. You know what I mean? And so how do you reconcile the traditional line of like, well, there's no grace outside the church, blah, 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 with like the reality people are experiencing. Like it's, it's very easy to reconcile if you have the experience. It's mm -hmm. only when someone is locked in to a certain perspective that these things become really problematic. But these things aren't problematic in the life of the church. Why? Because the church is led by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit understands how fallen human beings work. I mean, that's why, like, read the book of Acts, man. Like, there's so many things. If you read carefully the book of Acts, there's all kinds of things that happen there. You're like, whoa, what's going on there? It's because the Holy Spirit's living, and the laws that God establishes are perfect and good, but God also knows how to get human beings, which aren't perfect, to this place where they can be saved if they're willing to. And so I... I I just think all this is important because when we get stuck in, okay, this is how it's got to be. That's fine. But there may come a point where like, for your sake, Mr. I got it right. I got my eyes dotted and my T's crossed. Mr. I'm doing everything correct. You could really find yourself in a bind. It's like uh, that, that meme I sent the other day in the, uh, in the chat. With the guy in hell, yeah, <laughs> he's like, I was, but I was based. based. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's it's. Wouldn't the remedy be maybe to that? Wouldn't be like read some holy fools, like because like the holy fools really they yeah. they, they challenge the norms of what could be considered like a Christian action. Or, like, or 
forgive me, you're absolutely correct, but I'd even say read some holy fools in the light of the gospel or vice versa, or read the gospels in the light of mm. holy fools. Because, mm. I mean, that's what Christ, like, Christ, he's perfect, you know? He's the mm. one who established the law. And don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill the law and the prophets, but yes. he's fulfilling it in the proper way. See, the way that we want the law and the prophets fulfilled are the way that we can still wield the power and yeah. still be okay. And he wields it in a way where it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. Mm -hmm. You you fall upon the stone and you be broken versus the stone fall on you and you be crushed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the way that he wields these things because the reality of it is, is that he knows our weaknesses. Right? That's that's one of the big things about the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He knows our weaknesses. When you look at God's precedent, he's always choosing to go outside of the, the, the standards of the laws of men, getting back to Babylon, getting back to like what I was saying earlier, right? Abel over Cain, e, you know, Jacob over Esau, you know what I mean? Blah, blah, blah. We can go on and on and on and on and on, right? What is, it, what is he doing there? Like the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He's, he's always showing us that it isn't what you think. Because the way that you think, you you know, you want to be like the Gentiles who lord it over the others, right? That's our tendency, and he knows that. He knows that's part of our weakness. You know the. He knows that we, if we, if we're left to our own devices, we become Nazgul. That's what happens <laughs> to us. Oh, that's good. That's you know? good. Yeah. I think one of the one of the most difficult that I encountered this 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 weekend. It was kind of a touchstone of. I got to really appreciate how important developing an orthodox phronema is. I hadn't I hadn't been off the island for like or out of the Commonwealth for three years, basically, you know. And so I went to Palau and I went to this conference and it was interesting because there were it was it was a an interesting mix of like, you know, they have a strong tradition in Palau, like it's an independent country, but they have like the Palauan tradition that was developed in this very unique place. Where, and they're very proud of their tradition. Where's that at? Where's Palau it's, at? Uh, it's, it's in the Pacific. It's uh, to the west of us. Okay. Um, here in Saipan, it's in the same region of Micronesia, okay. but they're a little more kind of Indo, have an Indonesian uh, influence, but they're they're navigators, and they have it's 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 one of the most beautiful, crazy beautiful places I've ever been. It looks like the um, you know the the floating mountains in the Avatar movies. Oh, okay. It looks like that. Wow. Like, but wow. in the water, so people could people could look it up. There's a UNESCO World Heritage Site called the Palau Rock Islands, and you could go out there and sort of go around. It looks like something out of a video game. It doesn't, it doesn't look real at all. But one of the things that I was experiencing there was how, because there was all kinds of different folks, some WEF type, um, you, you know, Klaus Schwabian type of characters talking about governance. And there was some climate weirdos there. But then at the same time, there was like, a, so there was this, this interesting mix. And I was seeing people sort of unmoored and unable to 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 encounter something and know what was valuable so it started to become like oh if somebody is standing on stage this must be valuable what they're saying i should adopt it if if this person is saying this thing oh yeah that must be good rather than there were some being presented with things where it's like um no, that's immediately, immediately things about governance, you know, somebody saying something like, oh, no, we have to change how humanity is. Mm -hmm. And, oh, these systems, these old systems that we have, they don't work. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting, like, well, how did they get to be old then? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Like, yeah. if they don't work, how did they get to be old? And how are you going to sit in a place where people have been living for thousands of years practicing their same traditions and be like, oh yeah, that doesn't work. And like, they're like, I, actually, we're we're still getting fed with this. I don't understand what you, you're talking can about. Can you jump in on this, Cyprian, forgive me, because yes, it's please. a really good point. This is something that I know I've run across this. Like I have, uh, you know, it's just, it's hard, especially like um, 
I've encountered this where as a priest, uh, as you know, I have a spiritual child who suffers from this, right? And it's, it's, it's really tough. And it's real trying. But it's this idea of what you're saying. And then they can't wrap their mind around the fact that there is something that's absolute. Does this make sense what I'm saying? So it's like, they'll, they'll hear this like, okay, you gotta be willing to make a U-turn. You know what I mean? And they hear all this kind of like, they'll take that and they'll be like, well, you know, obviously we're learning from things and like we're past certain antiquated ideas. But then when you, when I say to them, it's like, look, look, Yes, I'm all about making a U-turn and you have to learn to make a U-turn because you are fallible. I am fallible. I do not think that just because I'm a priest, I'm infallible. Here's, here's, where, here's where my authority lies. And here's the thing. My authority doesn't lie in the fact that like, you know, I can talk in a certain way and just kind of like, yeah, whatever, make you think whatever. People can do that. People can talk in an authoritative manner. That doesn't mean they got authority, right? The reason why I have authority is because I'm always referring to the tradition of the church and the scriptures and the life of Christ. It has nothing to do with like, well, this is my spin on it. Because my spin on it is, who cares? Like, my spin on it's terrible, actually. You know what I mean? Like, you don't want my spin on it. You know, you want my spin on it insofar as, if I can help hook you out of the slime of your ego and the slime of like our weird, you know, soupy perspective on things and get us, get you on something solid. Okay, cool. Right. If I can use a colloquial expression to at least get your ears to open up to tradition. Great. Like that's my job. Okay. But my job is to get you on that foundation, which is not my opinion. Right. Right. And that's the thing, getting back to Andrew's earlier question about experience. Like, here's the, here's the formula, guys. You have an experience. You test the experience up against the tradition of the church. And you have someone who represents the church to validate, to check your work like math. Okay. Here's, you know, E plus, you know, E, right? Experience plus or CE, you know, ME plus CE, right? What happens? My experience versus church experience. Okay. Does it equate to something that's true? Well, if I hold up my experience to church experience and it bears out that my experience resonates and is validated, my experience is validated by church experience, not the other way around, right? That's what Protestants do. And people come into the church, they'll do that. They'll try to kind of like flip it, but it's like, no, you have to be willing to go like, if my experience doesn't match up with what the church it says, then I'm just going to ditch it. Yeah. I'm going to ditch it. And then I hold that up to the priest. Hey, is this, what do you think about this? Honestly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Because well, I'm going to tell you, sometimes you may be like, well, this isn't obviously the thing. And then you can be, and then the priest can be like, well, actually, no, that's legit because here, because, like, God forbid, you think that you know every single saint that ever existed. Here's a saint that actually can help validate kind of what you're going through. But you need to understand it and integrate that experience this way. Right? That's why, that's why it's so tough, guys. Because, I mean, I really do feel for people. Um, because they're in a place, there's a lot of people in a place where, they have they they unfortunately oh God, I'm gonna I'm gonna get hung for this one here, but I'll say it anyways. Um there's a lot of people who are in a context where they have priests who don't want to like even deal with that. I'm just it's just true. It's just true. I I'm I'm getting I get contacted every week by someone who's like, you know, blah blah blah. And like sometimes it's like, no, the priest is telling you something and you don't want to listen. Let's say that happens more times than not. Sure. That being said, there are unfortunately more people than there should be who they actually would be willing to take correction and guidance. But there's a lot of priests who have maybe been wounded. They've been hurt because they've been burned. People don't want to listen to them, whatever the thing is. And they don't want to give that direction. And it's, it's unfortunate because there's a lot of people who they realize you know, and it's it's one of the benefits, but it's also a hard place for those for people who have 
received formation via, you know, internet orthodoxy stuff on the internet is that they they're beginning to hear and understand like, yeah, okay, maybe the way isn't my perspective. And so they get that and they want to be submitted to authority. They want to be submitted in a way that is potentially healthy, but because we're in such a mess right now, people, you know, they can't find someone to take them on and to help guide them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure. And that, that to me is, is really, it's heartbreaking because when someone actually wants to submit themselves and they're willing to be obedient, there's nothing more endearing to Christ than someone who's willing to be, who wants to be obedient to him. You know what I'm saying? Um, if they actually want to be obedient and it's not just kind of like a, they're like a spiritual sycophant because those people exist. Too, sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, but I, I think, I think that's the thing because getting back to what Supreme was saying, um, there is this place for absolute because look, man, uh, you get these people who they don't understand and they, they think that like, oh, you just cherry pick fathers. No, like you don't just cherry pick fathers. Like it's the, cons- it's the patristic consensus that is, is once you get the formula, once you see it, it's really easy. I'm, well, forgive me. I don't should, it isn't really, it's simple. It's not easy. It's real simple. Right. And then you begin to see that consensus begins to lay out a proper way in which a, a, a soul is formed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Right, the fathers father, have forgive, figured for, it forgive, out. Forgive, forgive me, Father. There, I think also one of the things that that becomes clear to me is that there's a sort of a a. I don't know if I would use the the term arrogance, but there's this phenomenon of someone laboring under the idea that they're going to think or do or behave in some novel way in the context of their relationship with the church like oh "Oh, well maybe you know like this idea of like oh we're all still learning it's like no dude you think you're the first person Mm -hmm. in the in the whole history of the church to think no this bet on the fact that yes this has been thought someone has thought it it's already been dealt with many many times probably thousands of years ago and it's that I think it's that humility of like, dude, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to innovate some new thought. You're not going to have an innovative new thought in the context of Christ. But yet I do feel like there's so many people who really think that they're going to. No, 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 no. There's no, no. I, I'm not saying no to you. I'm saying no, no, no. It's so wrong yeah. that they have that. Like that's part of the that's one of the biggest problems when someone comes out of evangelicalism protestantism and just kind of american gnostic atheist soup because protestantism i'm being charitable by making a distinction between protestantism and evangelicalism (laughs) protestantism evangelicalism and like the kind of american soup the problem that they all three carry is that they think that their opinion matters right we've talked about this so many times and it's like they can't wrap their mind around the fact that like Maybe my opinion, like, really, and not even some weird, again, just kind of ape some, like, affect, but truly, you really believe that, like, yeah, you know what? It really doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Because I really have come to this place where, because the reason why Protestant churches, you know, kind of work the way they work, and the reason why people brought, burn out of them, evangelicalism, because you always got to have the hot take, man. You always got to have the hot take. Um, And that hot take, it's like, what's this new spin on whatever that I got to do? It's just like, man. How are you going to have a new spin on a 2000 year old tradition? What do you, I don't. It's crazy to me. And and, and I think, I think the thing is, is like, we kind of broached this a little bit, but it's like, okay, you know, I mean, whatever. I'm down for God to pull the plug on, on our project whenever that happens. But the thing about it is, is that, um, why is there so much repetition in the church? Because that's how, you know what I mean? Because we're so hard-headed. And, like, I think the reality is is that there's so many things that we think require us to kind of, like, how is, you know, like how are we going to understand this? What's, what's the thing on this? And really, I mean, I, I've come to understand 
a big portion of our project to just be like, it's not so much what's the hot take on this current thing, but how I, I think I'm hoping, you know, and again, for if I'm wrong, if we're wrong, we're wrong. But the big thing is like the way this machine works is here's the current thing. Let's put it in the hopper. And with God's help, we'll see how does it match up with what the church says. Do you, do you see the thing? Yeah. So yeah. it's not about us giving a hot take. It's about like, how is this thing holding up against what the church teaches? Because Does we're that acknowledging that there's nothing new under the sun. Like that's, in that's doing the big that, thing. that's that's the presupposition is whatever yeah. the thing is, it's it's not new. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. The question it's an old question in a yeah. new wrapper. Yeah. And it's and the answer is already in the church. Yeah. And it's yeah. there every single time. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like it's almost like if people just saw whatever we're doing as that. It's like we're trying to, with God's help, by leading in the Holy Spirit, understand how it to take off the facade of the newness, take off the facade of the novel, take off the facade of like, this is, the church has never faced something like this before. What do we do? It's like, okay, let's get past the like, okay, let's have some fun. Let's, you know, let's get our tinfoil hats on. Let's have some fun. But ultimately... It's going to come down to, it's going to be talked about in the fathers somewhere, somehow. It's going to be in the hagiography somewhere, somehow. It's going to be in the scriptures somewhere, somehow. I don't care if it's aliens. I don't care if it's vaccines. I don't care if it's, you know, gay, transsexual, pedophile bishops. I don't care what it is. The church has an answer for it, and it isn't going to be something innovative. Actually, quite the opposite. When we're looking for the hot take, that's where we're in trouble. So that's my big thing is like, I don't want to look for the hot take. I want to look for like, what does the tradition say? Because you come to this place and that's where I'm at in my life is like, I'll spill my blood for the tradition because I realize that the tradition is where that fidelity to Christ has been manifested, incarnated throughout the centuries. And I bet my life on it. I bet my family on it. I bet my soul on it. I trust it. Right? And I don't trust I don't trust the guy who wants to come in and be like, hey, check out this new book with this, like, this guy said, I don't care what that guy says. I don't care. You know what I mean? I don't I don't care what he says. I don't trust him. He may have something like whatever. I don't trust him. Right? It, we don't we don't need to know. I don't care about the I don't care about the abduction. I don't care about whatever. Like I care enough to say, okay, other people are gonna be chewing on this. Let's try to let's try to point them to where like no 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 no, abductions are just demons whatever. Sorry, it's fresh in my mind. I was just watching an abduction guy before we started, but like you, you get what I'm saying. It's like all these yeah. things they're, they're not they're not some kind of crazy new thing, you know. And even and even I think that's part of the thing which you know we haven't talked about it for a while, but I think even with like the AI issue. And watching, you know, I've been watching some people, not just because I think it's kind of like died down and now people are comfortable, which is really scary. But I think there's people who are waking up to the fact of like, okay, yeah, I'm not going to fight for this thing. Like, it's just, you know what I mean? It, It's clearly not good. You know what I mean? And it may be a reality that it's kind of, it's going to subsume the world, whatever, that's fine. But that doesn't mean it's, it's good. Getting us back to lot. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, you know, there was this weird tolerance that Lot developed <laughs> to be amongst those degenerates, which someone could argue he shouldn't have been there, and that's fine. I, I'm not going to argue with the other. The fact of the matter was he was there. You know what I'm saying? And God still sought to deliver him through the intercessions of the patriarch Abraham. Very key. Very mm. key. But that reality means that you know, there's something to be said for surviving and, and bearing witness and being a remnant, you know? And it's, I'm not saying, like, we need to be kind of, like, um, so self-sufficient, arrogant to be like, I'm going to be the remnant, you know? It's not that, but it's like, look, it's like us here. We find ourselves in in Kansas City, in the hood, and it's like, okay, yeah, if I could snap my fingers and lift up my whole community and everybody I love and you know, everything like this flock that God's given me and transport us magically to 
you know, Montana. We can live like, okay, that, but that's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? And, and even if it could, something else is going to come for us there. Sure. You know what I mean? So it's all about bearing witness where you're at because there's no escape. <laughs> and that's not a black pill. That's just like, no. That's just, you know, that's what we're called to do. We're called to bear witness. That's that's martyr, right? To like to bear witness. So in my mind, I think it doesn't matter whether it's AI, whether it's transgenders, whether it's Kratom, whether it's like, I don't know what people are into. Like whatever the whatever the issue is, you know, God will lead us if we're willing to hear from him, right? And say, okay, you know, I, I need to make a U-turn or I need to just kind of like stand my ground. But either way, I'm going to make that choice based upon willing to listen and and and, and be led. You know what I'm saying? That's, I, that's think, the- I think, forgive me, Father. I think that, that that piece, I, I think the Protestant understanding of that, and I, I have even felt this from, I think, some let's say some of the this sort of new group that have come into the church is still a little bit of a disconnect in terms of like i'm willing to listen and be led mm-hmm. that it's that it's not like that's a meta protestants and evangelicals will say that but it's a metaphor mm-hmm. it's not like they're like oh i'll read the i'll read the scriptures and be led by that and it's like yes and it's like i'll i'll read this and be led by that yes as opposed to actually being like, no, I actually want to know God's will through a relationship with Christ that is that that I am establishing and re-engaging with through praxis, and that it's actually like real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That like God's will will be made manifest like in real time on a daily basis, and mm-hmm. I'll be given the opportunity to wh- do I obey or not, and it's not about me it's like oh here's the choice okay got to make a choice yeah. am i obedient yeah it's and, not and it's not a metaphor you know it's not a metaphor and the reality is is like why do i feel like god needs to rearrange everything for me you know what i'm saying like he already established a certain way of doing something so why does he need to like all of a sudden now do it differently for you you know and, and it's tough i get it but at the end of the day you know what what is ultimately um one of the things that i think ultimately people are missing out on is again you know this very painful reality that you know forgive me being the broken record but this very painful reality of like per, not only perhaps have i got this wrong but perhaps I, I really haven't, I, I, I've had an idol of what I thought was Christ. Mm. You, know what, you know what I mean? I just, I know people just don't want to face that, but I just see it so often still. You know what I mean? I see it. I see it, especially with people who are coming to the church. Listen to me very carefully. People who are coming to the church without that kind of like, place of you know witnessing horror and being broken though the people who rock bottom forgive me father they have they're not coming from rock bottom yeah not coming from rock bottom and these people were like yeah i've got some sin i got whatever you know but and they want to throw in the butt and they want to then tell me how they're they've been like they basically want to go and tell me how they're righteous that that's basically what i see a lot of actually the last two years of with a lot of people coming in and talking is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I got this in that, but you know, and they, they think that they, they think they discovered the church. You know what I mean? And I'm off to say, you didn't discover the church. I don't care what you think. I really don't. I really, really don't. I don't care if you think you studied your way in here. I don't think it's because you think that you read Vladimir Lossky or you read, you know, blue light jazz. I don't care what you read. The only reason why you even like have approached this because God in his mercy opened a crack for you somewhere. And if you, the, the person who doesn't realize that is the person who's going to have a real long way around the mountain. I mean, but if you can just, if you can just be like, you know what, man, thank you, God, because it doesn't even matter if, if 
it doesn't matter that it was YouTube that God used. God still used it. And it's, it's, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even be able to like care. Like the only reason why I didn't even shut down this weird thought about some weird religion I never heard of is maybe because God was having mercy on you at the time. You know what I'm saying? And and I, that disposition is so hard for people because so many people who they came in and they, they think that they came in because they're good, they're moral, they're, you know, they're not woke, they're not gay, they're not trans, they're not whatever. It's like, God that's great. Thank them for the ark or whatever. Like, wow, congratulations, Moses 2.0. Come aboard, you know. What I mean? you know? But, but, but you come in and guess what? Now you're going to be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now you're going to be a problem for everybody else because pretty soon you'll be humble just enough to be made a catechumen. You'll be humble enough, maybe just enough to get some chrism thrown on you. God... God willing, you know, get you baptized, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, just give it some time. Next thing you know, you're calling shots. Yeah. And next thing you know, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, man, you haven't even begun the spiritual life. You don't even, you don't even know the language. You know. You don't even know the language, you know. Abbot Nikon from that book, his letters. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I keep coming back to it, but he talked about you can't marry the gospel to what you already believed. You have to like throw out the playbook. And like some of that stuff you can retain. And like I came into orthodoxy on the end of my psychonaut journey where I had really, and I had finally for the first time in my whole life, things were ordered and made sense. I was working out, I was eating right because I had finally con contact with spiritual entities. I was finally experiencing life. I was loving things. I was every day is beautiful. And, all this stuff looking back is very thin. I was still getting mad at ridiculous things. I was still being a jerk to my girlfriend, now wife. I was still being arrogant. I was still whatever, whatever. So I finally came in and it was because I felt like I'd finally got my life ordered. I could come into the church and then pretty much got it to take all that like whopper of crap and throw it out too and be like, okay, some of the stuff you can hold on to. But all this stuff about whatever, whatever that you're feeling about, whatever, like whatever, like church canon issue, whatever, it's just got to go. Like there's just like and then only when it was like, finally, was I like, OK, maybe I really just don't know anything. And, you know, that moment passed and I've taken some of my bad stuff back and all this stuff and I have to ditch it again, whatever. But it was finally when it was like, I maybe I just and like that's the point. Or to speak about something that Father said earlier, that's to the point where it's like we've all been raised to believe that this is the peak of civilization. Mm -hmm. Like we have never come this far before. So, of course, we would understand things differently than they would, say, St. John Chrysostom or St. Gregory, you know, like, oh, you know, well, they were kind of a little anti Semitic. You because know, people are different, Andrew. We pe people, the fundamental evolved. nature of human beings has yeah. changed so yeah. much in 2000 years. <laughs> it's, so I've said it before and I'll say it again. And Cyprian's right. I mean, like it's this unconscious, unspoken thing of, well, I would never have wanted to live 100 years ago because they just all died and. I mean, maybe that's true, but like maybe like a thousand years ago, whatever, they'd be like, well, they didn't even, you know, the, the sun came up and they were scared as a God coming to eat them or something. I, was like, I don't think that that's true. Like, I really don't think that that's true. And not only that, maybe we're the idiots. Like, maybe we're the people that they're hey, like. Did, did they did they did they walk around uh, poking poking each other with uh, with crazy juice uh, <laughs> when there's a flu? You know what I mean? Like, no, I mean, they didn't do it. They didn't do anything. I mean, billions of them did. Did billions of any of our forefathers, dude? We are at we we are so did, did like we have degenerated so far. I mean, at this thing that I was at, there was multiple. Like, there's a longevity movement. That's a that's yeah. a fancy name for we think we can live forever. Yeah, and like the all of these people presenting, oh, we're going to build a city that's going to be a longevity city. We're going to invest in all this biotech and everything because you know what the biggest killer is? Aging. And I was like, what? Yeah. No. <laughs> there's been. <laughs> Wait. And he was like, 
we lose millions of people to aging every year. And I was like, is it? We've that? had a we've had a <laughs> spike a in cases of aging. <laughs> we've had a spike in cases of aging. We but... gotta stop this aging epidemic. I was like, wow, yeah, we've really we're we're at the like putting Brondo on the plant. Like, stage like, like for no, me, but no, okay. I'm sorry. Me, Father, I just... one second. I'm sorry. No, yeah, because that that is it. Because I cannot go to Walmart. Like on the whole, I think I'm just about done with Walmart. Like, I don't know. And it's maybe it's my specific Walmart I go to. I get so angry whenever I go in there. Like I literally have been trying to pray like to my guardian angel before I go in because there's something buzzy about that place. I don't know what's going on. It's the frantic consumers. But like when I see the employees, it's like, and like, you know, I'm not trying to bad mouth anyone. I understand you got to work with the jobs that you got to work and you understand the, the situations that you end up in, whatever, that's fine. But like when that part, when they walk in an idiocracy to the Costco, hello, welcome to Costco. I love you. It's like, it is so ridiculously close to that. And, and like when you go outside and like there's all these people, all these workers sitting around like vaping and like on their phones, just nonstop. It's like, it is not too far Here's off. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is what I was going to say. People have lost the grace of death and everything is moving them to be dulled to that grace giving question of when am I going to die? Everything. Violent video games, violent movies, vaping, porn, um, anti-aging cream, um, breast augmentation, Viagra, uh, hair implants, dying hair. Uh, like everything is about trying to avoid that question of like death. I'm going to be warm food, right? Like if if you seriously ask yourself, when am I going to die? What's going to happen? When I, like, like really, that's, that's what's lacking. None of those people are, are worried about their death. They're all avoiding it. They're all hiding from it. It's all, it's all the denial of it. And I would say, because I was going to say earlier, I just, I just want to say this because I, I have a feeling this is me being that kind of swami guy. There's somebody in the audience who ate cheese and crackers. And right, but <laughs> there's I know someone out there, so I'll just like hopefully someone will timestamp this too. Okay, but what if you got a priest who's like all on board with every modern agenda and this and this and that? Okay, check this out. If you are willing to turn to Christ and say, Christ, I just I'm begging you, I want to be obedient to you, please just help me to find the right way. If you really mean that. And you're, you're willing to do whatever, God's going to guide you. I feel comfortable saying that. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. You can't check your brain out the door. Because when you talk about obedience and talk about discernment, you can't check your brain out the door. So let me give you a couple tips, right? If someone starts saying like, well, dot, 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 ellipsis, the canons, or well, the tradition, da, da, da then you should maybe start considering, okay, you know, let me hear what he's saying. But if someone's questioning like the foundation of the church, okay, maybe you got a problem. Let me give you another one. If you find the person that you're, you're looking to, to give you guidance um, is either a willing to say, I don't know about something and B they're very, um, you know, they don't want to talk about death. You got a problem, right? You got a problem. Because, like, not to be that guy, I'll just say, you know, I'm often to tell people, like, my job is to prepare you for death. That's, that's why I don't really get caught up in a lot of the things that, like, a lot of other people might think. Like, I don't want to talk about certain things um, because my, my thought is, this isn't really getting someone ready to either face Christ or like to die or whatever, you know, it's like, I, we can make any question get there if you want. Um, but I think that like the problem is that if you're not willing to put the work in to get someone to that point where the question that you're asking is going to lead them to like repentance and death and the question of death. And like, I don't want to talk about it. Like for instance, like, 
like tattoos or something like that. I'm just kind of like, yeah, we can talk about it and like we can get into Vainglory and we can get all this stuff. But the problem with it is, is like we're not even on that level. You're just you want to talk about, let's say, tattoos. That's an easy one because it's like it's weird and it's vain and blah, blah, blah. It's like, OK, great. But like. The person, it doesn't matter because you're going to die. So let's so if we talk about death in the light of that, then we can have that conversation because the person then will kind of come to a more proper conclusion. So let's just insert anything in that equation, right? Any gray area that you want to talk about, if you're willing to make a U-turn on it, great. That's a great start. And then to complete that equation, let's talk about death, right? Because here, here again, I'm not being spooky. I'm not being, I'm not being a metal priest. Uh, I'm just... I am telling you, right? Because <laughs> that's another thing I think people think, right? But but but, but forgive, forgive me, Father. Forgive me, Father. So many of the fathers, that especially the the deep ascetics, say you should be thinking about your death all the time. Elder, all the time. like it should be constantly Merite, on your mind Merite. all the time, yeah. all the time. And I'm gonna tell you something. It brings grace. Saint Isaac the Syrian mm-hmm. talks about it, and I think is like it's his forty sixth homily. I think don't quote me on the number. But like, I'm, I'm telling you from experience, you know what I mean? Not just my own personal one, but I've seen it turn people around. Death. And, and, and have, have we not learned, right? I mean, here's, here's another thing, which this is a whole other topic, right? Which will probably come to the end. But like, you know, we got COVID 2.0 coming around the corner. And how many people have forgotten I think there's a lot of people that are forgotten, right? But like death, let's talk about death and let's talk about the, the, the grace of death, that grace inducing question of death and meditating on it. Because once you really, really meditate on it and not in a, not in a black metal way, not in a goth way, although that's fun and fine. But once you really be like, man, you know, like, Here's a great one. Uh, Elsa Froney talks about it. Uh, and other fathers maybe talk about it, but Elsa Froney is what most uh, Saints of Froney is what most familiar with. But beyond what Saints of Froney says, not that there's anything beyond that, I'll just tell you from my own personal experience, what I'm about to share with you, Zoom land people, YouTube people, is true. Uh, you can come to a point where what you perceive to be prayer will leave you while you're dying. I've seen it. I've seen it. So this is why, like, for me, when I press people on, like, prayer and, like, moving past the kind of, like, form of prayer, like St. Theophan talks about, you get to these places where, like, what you think is prayer will lead you. Your cognitive functions begin to fail you. If you haven't come to this place of experiencing the the light of Christ, which is painful and burning at times, right? If you haven't come to that place, man, you should be concerned. I know people are like scared. Good. I hope you're scared. I really do. Because if you're just going through the motions to be a good quote, quote unquote Orthodox Christian, it's not good enough. Because when, when you are facing death, if God grants you the grace of, of, kind of knowing when you're going to die, meaning like it's not a like sudden car accident or you're like murdered, right? But like you have some sort of like illness, terminal illness or something like that. If God grants you that grace, then then that's a different thing. You know, like you begin to see like, okay, yeah, cognitive functions can fail. So stop messing around, man. Do you know what I mean? Like there's no reason for anyone to really be... S- Listen, we all struggle. We all struggle with being on the phone too much. It, it's the demons laugh at us all. I'm not, I'm not exempt from it. But if we can just inject a little bit of the anti-venom and just remembering you're going to die. Like, you're not going to be young and beautiful forever. You're not going to be strong and healthy forever. I'm not, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't like hyperbole. And this isn't, again, this isn't like spooky, scary talk. I'm telling you, your back will go out. Your eyes will fail you. You'll get diabetes. You'll get liver disease. You'll get cancer. Your wife will get cancer. You you may have a child or two that die. People may get sick. Like, 
that, if you, if you hold on to that, then you're on your way to Christ, then you're on your way to repentance, then you're on your way to being really orthodox. And that's why, to make this all practical, that's how you can start discerning if you're in the right place with the right priest. If he's not prepping you to die, if he's not prepping you to kind of like really face these ultimate questions, get out of there. I mean, if you got someone who's just kind of like a TED talk or something, a TED talk, you know, wine that like Nephilim are cool, but who cares, man? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's like, like, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't make the connections on those things, who cares? Right. This is why the Neptic fathers matter. This is why saints like St. Joseph the Hesychast, St. Sophroni, when you look at the caliber of the saints that God has sent in the last, that God has revealed in the last, in these last days, St. Paisios, St. Sophroni, St. Joseph the Hesychast, St. Porfirios, right? Uh, uh, St. Jacobo. St. Seraphim Rose. St. Seraphim Rose. They all are like, you know, St. Elder, you know, St. Cleopa of, of Romania. Like, they all are like, hey, <laughs> you're going to die. And this yeah. whole world is, is vain and it's an illusion, right? So if you got to work at Boeing, cool. There's no problem you work at Boeing. If you got to work at McDonald's or McDonald Douglas, because, right, there's both, right? <laughs> okay, that's great. But guess what? Whether you're flipping a burger or whether you're flipping an engine turbine, right? McDonald's or McDonald Douglas. Guess what, man? Uh, someone told this to me the other day. Shout out to Nick, whatever. And it's super good, right? The house that you are, you know, slaving away to pay for for your kids, someone else is going to have that house. Someone else is going to live in that house. You know what? If you're really weird and you think about it, like I had to stop myself thinking about it when we bought our house. I was like, oh, man, how many people have lived in here? Yeah. You know what I mean? How many people have lived in here? It's like, oh, good thing there's a house blessing. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the reality. That's the reality. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care what you're doing, right? So, so what, Father? Should we just like all act like whatever? No. Work your job, man. Do your best to leave some sort of inheritance for your kids, but just understand what the real inheritance is. Yeah. The real inheritance isn't the what 50k. And the house that they may or may not be able to keep because of property taxes. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm just telling you from experience, like, you know, my dad left me nothing, you know, in material sense, but actual debt. But everyone who listens to this podcast, forgive me. Everyone who hears a homily, forgive me. Everyone who is a spiritual child of mine, forgive me. You still benefit from the wisdom of John Paul Qualls because that's the legacy he left. And that legacy has been enriched, nurtured, and baptized because the Orthodox faith through the prayers of, you know, all the saints. Like, that's legacy. And if you don't understand that, like, you're, you're, it's like St. Joseph the Hezekiah says, it's, it's work without pay. It's work without pay. You know what I mean? So make the U-turn and just really, like, you can wake up tomorrow. You don't, you don't have to be like, I'm going to quit my job. I mean, you can do that if you want. But it's like you wake up tomorrow, you're like, I'm going to go to my job and I'm going to just like live my life like I'm going to die, right? And so I'm going to be a man of integrity at work, a man of integrity at my house. Or, hey, you know, I'm a modern guy. I'm going to be a woman of integrity at my work. <laughs> I'm going to be a woman of integrity at hey, my house. Way to throw a bone to the wokes, father. You know I mean, what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I, I just, you know, just, you're going to die, right? And so, not like Tim McGraw. Don't live like you were dying like Tim McGraw. Who's that? Someone out, someone, he's a country singer. Someone out there is going to get that, but he has a whole song, Live Like oh, You Were cool. Dying. He went Rocky Mountain climbing. He went he went skydiving, Rocky Mountain climbing in 2.7 seconds on a bull named Blue Man Shoe. Yeah. So, but this is more like, be dead be or be scared because like one day you're going to look at your comic book collection and realize like, oh yeah, that's either going to end up in the dump or like at Goodwill or your family's going to sell it so that they can, you know, get the 500 bucks it's worth or something like that. And then all that time spent into that collection doesn't really mean diddly squat. And that's real talk. 
there's a painting at the Kansas City um, Art Museum, and uh, they have this this weird thing. It's just this is one painting. They really break it down. It's like a Dutch painting or something like that. And I looked into it. Or it says. Like on the piano, it's some kind of symbolism having to do with the piano. Like one, of, I think one of the legs is broken and held up by a skull or something like that. I can't remember what it what it means, but on uh, uh, in Dutch, I think the language on the side of the piano says like "learn to die." So speaking of like of like the things that we've lost, is that that grace of death? Yeah, because like like there is no um, the, the, yeah. I like to summarize what Father is saying and say it not nearly as well. But there is none of that. Like, there is no, like, does Animal Crossing really matter? Like, d does, like, does, does it, does social media stuff, does this really matter? Because, like, you look at the way that, like, um, people honor the dead in Western secular society, and it's really bleak. If you're really lucky, you get a bridge named after you. You're, like, really lucky. And, like, what, what lack of comfort? To like the people who love that, like that, you know, that U.S. State Patrol or US, yeah, like me. Highway Patrol. Forgive me, I'm on fire. I just want to say this. That's another thing about coming into the church. And like, man, when you see the veneration of the saints, there's eternal life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, th that's like, it. Like it that. literal, literally. Yeah, like literally, literally, and in the world. Yeah, like that's it right there, and that—that's why another thing too. I mean, forgive me, you know, I'm sorry, guys, whatever. But I got certain people in mind, whatever. But like, you know, it's—it's it's a thing of, man, you just, ah, oh, it, it's just hard because you know, ultimately, it's just God loves everyone, wants them to be saved. But like, man, if, like, just get over your issues, man. Um, Protestantism stupid. I'll just say it. Protestantism stupid. It's false. It's a false religion. Um, and you you have a hunger for Christ in spite of it. I'll, I said it. Okay, fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll just get over it, right? Why? Because the saints are real. Like, if they weren't real, okay, whatever. But they're real. They exist. They're not dead, right? And I'm not just hoping they're not dead. I'm telling you, I know they're not dead, yeah. right? So, like, there's eternal life right there. You know what I mean? And then once you get past some of the stuff we, we were talking about, you, you snack on some, a word from an elder. You snack on a particular portion of the gospel, and it just it lights you up, and it goes forever. There's eternity, right? We talked about, we talked about this, like, what, four years ago, whatever, you know, uh, on one of the earlier episodes. Like, Keep thy mind in hell and despair not. That's not Silouan. That's Christ. Yeah. That's that's Christ's words. And you can tell it's Christ's words because it's just it's there's no boundary to it. It just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. There's your little taste of eternity, right? So how do it is bleak, like you said, Andrew? Great. I'm gonna get a bridge that no one's gonna maintain. That someone eventually is going to die on because no one maintained it, no one cared about, or some terrible, you know, goofball put some, you know, crappy graffiti on there. So what? You know what I mean? Maybe I'll get a sandwich named after me, which is a little bit better than a bridge, but not much. You know what I mean? So, so what? Ultimately, though, when someone recognizes you as one of the holy ones, and that bridge between this life and the next is, is, you know stamped and blessed and ratified it's like now you're talking right and that's why you got to get rid of this stuff because your perspectives on everything else are keeping you from entering into that space of communing with them and communing with the the um the inhabitants of the kingdom of heaven right yeah. no it's it's um it's uh one of those things that people uh don't want to think about and because uh, the world doesn't really offer anything too cool, it doesn't really offer anything that's like, hey, as long as this per, as long as we remember this person, they're kind of alive for forever. And it's like, well, eventually those people are going to die too. So then, but anyway, gentlemen, we're coming up on two hours. Um, I'm going to leave it here with. I'm reading the life of Saint Paisios right now.
and he, I kind of did, I kind of think it was not the worst idea to tell a story that he talked about. We can end on that. Um, that he talked about, he was a radio operator during the Greek civil war between the communists and the, and the, um, I'm not too confident on who the sides were, but there was the people who didn't want the communists. And then there are the communists. And he was on the side of the people who didn't want the communists and he was fighting. Right. And so he tells this story. He was a radio operator because he specifically asked to God when he, you know, enlisted, I don't want to kill anyone. Like, can you please put me in a position where I don't have to kill anyone? And so he became a radio operator. So he's, basically in the situation in the forest where they're surrounded on all sides by the gorillas and they're all firing at him. And he runs off to go get a radio signal, going to signal for backup. We need help. We need help. We need help. And everyone is getting all messed off, like peeved off at him because they're like, we need you to get a gun and start firing. And he's like, but I'm trying to get help. And he said, this is the way that people get mad at monks and priests to retreat from the world who like go to find like to to, like they retreat away from people like they retreat away from people and he specifically had to in that story retreat away from people because in order to get that signal Mm -hmm. and to lessen the confusion and the and the noise and the chaos that was happening all around him he's like we do not need one more person with a gun firing there's already 200 people firing guns we don't need that. What we need is person asking for help. And like that was the, that's the monk, that's the priest retreating away from the people. It's just saying like, please send help. We need help. We don't need one more person down there on the front lines, which is so antithetical to what's being shoved down our throat about what social justice is, what social justice work is now. It's like, no, we don't need people praying. We need people in the streets, handing out stuff, doing things, blah, 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 blah. And he, he told this story a lot as it being like, look, you have to understand this is what monks do. Monks retreat so that we can ask God for help and we need to retreat away from people. Anyway, I read that and I was like, well, that's going on the podcast. So there it is. And his absolutely incredible, like this dude, absolutely like insane. Saint, talk about just this saint of, you know, the latter days, you know, like not even like I was alive when he was alive. Like that's insane to me. That is absolutely insane to me. I had six wonderful years on this world before he died. And I was just like, well, anyway, so we're going to wrap it up there. Um, We have a promotional video for the Mount Tabor School of Liberal Arts in Kansas City, Missouri. We are going to include in the uh, description. description. Please check it out. Everybody check it out. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's yeah. It's absolutely good. amazingly well done. Every single person when we showed it at church, uh, every single eye was immediately started crying. Like everybody immediately started crying because we realized how important this is. Those are our kids. Those are that's we're, we're doing what we can to try and make sure that they get a good education and like because- and hopefully it'll inspire people to really do the same where they're at, you yeah. know, or come here <laughs> one of the no. two you know but uh one of those options you know do it where you're at or come here you know because it's you know uh get on the arc yeah that's, <laughs> get on that's the where arc. my kids are going that's where my kids are going and i feel fully confident with that decision uh we will include the link in the description um to that video please watch it please 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 watch it and of course you know if you feel like throwing some scrap that'd be great that'd be great you know the church the you know donations are welcome. yeah donations are always welcome um besides that thank you uh for listening um anytime we mention music it goes on a playlist on spotify called spot uh royal path podcast playlist something like that we have a store royalpath.store we don't see any of that money for merch we have new merch up it's finally officially up uh, atlantis will rise again is on there it looks sweet i'm eventually i'm going to order something it's great i love it um and then also thank you um for the thumbnails those are awesome absolutely awesome uh still killing it um and i think that that's all that we do oh if you want to contact us you can reach out to me at andrew at royalpath.network lots of people are still doing that but if you want an official and timely response with 
legit information on how to get a hold of a priest who knows what he's talking about, please contact contact at royalpath.network. And if you emailed me, you'll get a response in the next couple of weeks. And it'll probably be something like, I don't know this answer to this issue. Let me refer you over to Father Turbo. And that'll be that. Um, those are my three favorite letters, by the way. Or my three favorite words is, I don't know. I have no idea. It's just like, it's a wonderful Liberty. thing. So oh, fun. man, is it great. It just yeah. takes so much weight off your <laughs> shoulders. Yeah. It's great. Anyway, that's my favorite Andrew WK song, too. I don't know. I have no idea. So um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.